Now Wait. there are more lights. forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again let's do that again I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me Because you died and rose again Amazing love, how can it be That you, my king, would die for me Amazing love, I know it's true It's my joy to honor you in all I forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing love amazing love how can it be that you my king would die for me Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. You are my king. You are my king. Jesus, you. joy to honor you. Amazing love, amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me, die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I If there was ever a time where the sons and daughters of God needed to rise up in the spirit of Elijah, that time is right now. More and more people are forgetting who our God is, that he is who he has always declared himself to be, and he can still do exactly what he said he can do. you 
right where he has placed you to be used for his purposes and his glory. Because we operate by the power and the presence and the discernment of the Spirit of God, we should still be able to live in alignment with the promises that our God has declared to us. to increase the number of tech staff and in some of the video teams. So if you have uh, an interest in that and is willing to be trained by our uh, uh, team, we would love to have you be part of that process and help in the training of our other engineers over the years. And then also, I just want to take a moment to uh, Mother's Day is coming up, and the only church that is actually on Mother's Day is Mother's Day. So let's call it Mother's Day. darkness tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken no I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. longer has a place to hide and I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind cause I won't be shaken no I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. 
power in your name. There's power. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. There's power in your name. My faith doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My faith doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My faith doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. I'm standing in your love. became flesh and the light shined among us his glory revealed living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day they led him Calvary's mountain, one day they nailed him to die on a tree, suffering and Despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. The hand that healed nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails from me. Living, He loved me, dying, He saved me, buried, He carried my sins far away. Rising, he just by freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day.
Mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. I love your voice. You have been. darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God your goodness is running out your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down, I surrender now. I'll give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With your life laid down, I surrender now. I'll give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. All my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. One more time. I will sing of the goodness of God.
Christ. Uh, death and burial is not working. Okay. Is that better? Do you want me to tell the Paul joke again or everybody get that one? <laughs> tell it again. <laughs> We, we uh, just celebrated Easter and uh, heard about Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And um, shortly after that, um, as he has uh, been reborn, he's, he stays around for a while. And um, I think that's an important time. And it's important to note what he did and what he said during those times. So if you go to the, the book of Matthew, we go to the very end, we, we hear the last two recorded uh, verses uh, of what Christ spoke to his disciples. He said, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And know I am always with you even to the end of the world. So Christ tells us to, to go out into the world um, and, and preach the gospel. And um, in my younger years, I had opportunity to go to several different countries, um, Jamie as well, and um, countries like Russia, Mongolia, uh, Cambodia, Thailand, uh, Japan, Nicaragua. And what you learn very quickly is that the, there's, there's not the opportunities in those countries like we have here to hear about Christ. Um, there's not Awanas, there's not Wednesday night men's groups. Um, there's not two services on Sundays. Um, a lot of uh, folks just, just don't have the opportunity. Um, you drive down our highways and you see billboards here in our country that preach uh, of what Christ has done and what he offers. And um, so there is there is great need around around the world. Um, you could put, put up a map and throw a dart at the map and you would hit a country that has a need. It is true that you could also throw a lawn dart in your backyard, and if you didn't kill somebody, you'd probably also have somebody that was in need. And so that need exists in this country too, but the need is certainly great around the world, and we are called to go around the world. And so we, we in most congregations, uh, missions work is sort of reactive, where a, a need is, a, is identified, and then it's presented to the church, and the church decides whether or not to be involved in it. And what Pastor Paul helped lead was um, more of a proactive approach to missions work. And so we, we met as a group and went through a rather significant binder. Um, I have even got my name tags on here, so it was an official meeting. You have name tags, so it's official. <laughs> and really the goal was to look at who we are as a congregation, what what are the gifts that God has given us as a congregation? Where are our passions? And then trying to find um, a, a, a mission that really fits who we are. And so that, that was the goal. And the purpose for that is really to maximize our skills, our, our hearts for, for different areas where God has called us and given us gifts and really maximize the opportunity that we have to make an impact. Um, so it's not just about fulfilling a need, but really using the gifts God has given us to fulfill that need. And so that brought us to Ryan and Kristen, and so we're excited to hear about what, what they're doing and, and the Quechua people. Um, but really the hope through this whole process is that as a, as a body we are able and have the opportunity and feel led to be more engaged in, in that mission work and, uh, and that mission project. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Hey, uh, Ryan, why don't you come up? And I just two very brief things. Uh, Phil said it very well. Uh, I have, I have um, well, more than two, but two truth tellers in my life have spoken to me. One of them, uh, who I'm married to, uh, said, you know, now, Paul, you've got this passion for this. You sense God's leading for the Quechua initiative. But the whole congregation has to catch that, too, pardon the pun. And um, uh, so she's right. And that's what I'm praying will happen, help happen a little more today. And the other comment I appreciate is that don't promise too much so too soon. You know, we're in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, Peru uh, is right next to Brazil. Brazil is exploding with this uh, uh, variant. And so Peru's in lockdown. And, and we've got a few issues here we're working through. And so uh, it, it won't happen overnight. But I'm so excited to have Ryan with us to share 
uh, his vision. So welcome. All brother. right. Thank you, Pastor Paul. First thing I want to say about Ryan, too, is, you know, I've, the first time I met him yesterday, and um, he's a lot taller than he looks on Zoom. <laughs> what a compliment, huh? <laughs> Thanks for that compliment. Appreciate that. I'm taller than he thought I was on Zoom. That's always a good thing. So, all right. Well, it's good to be with uh, Riverwood this morning and to, to be able to share God's word with you. Uh, I want to start just by um, introducing myself in the Ojibwe language. You can see uh, my wife and uh, our three boys there. Um, introducing myself in the Ojibwe language, I would say, Buju Anishinaabe, Ryan O'Leary Nindijinakas, Makwa Nindudem, Asabi Kanazaga Igani Nindujiba, Bamichigamag Ninda, Magwich Bijayak. Ojibwe introduction. I started with the words Buju Anishinaabe. Buju means hello, Anishinaabe means original people. And then I said Ryan O'Leary and Indigenous which means I am or I call myself Ryan O'Leary. And I said the words Makwa Nindudem. Makwa meaning bear, Nudem meaning clan, meaning I come from the bear clan. Uh, indigenous culture is a clan based society. And my father comes from the bear clan, and so I, uh, I am from that clan as well. And then I said, Asabi Kanazaga Igane Nindujiba. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Um, that means I come from uh, the Nut Lake Band or the Boys Fort Band of Ojibwe. Uh, Nut Lake is an Ojibwe tribe in northern Minnesota that I am I'm a member in. I am enrolled in that tribe. And then I said, Bemidji Gamag Ninda, which means I currently live in Bemidji, the city of Bemidji. And then I said, Miigwech Biajayag, or thank you for listening to me today. It's an honor to be at Riverwood this morning again and just to be able to connect with people and get to know the church a little bit better and uh, even get to know Pastor Paul. Uh, it was an honor yesterday to be able to go to the men's breakfast. We had a great time. Paul, Pastor Paul was very creative. He uh, set up this hockey game. I played college hockey at the University of Denver and Pastor Paul knew about that. And so he set up this game. It was the University of Denver versus the Minnesota Gophers. I was, of course, on the DU side, and I'm happy to announce that the University of Denver won that game yesterday at the men's breakfast. My wife, Kristen, and I are converged global workers to indigenous peoples in the Americas. And just this past summer, we agreed to start leading something called the Quechua Initiative that Riverwood is feeling called by God to, to be a part of. And so I want to speak about that today. Uh, Converge has these different global initiatives to work with unreached people group, underreached people groups, and Converge has identified the Quechua people and indigenous people group in South America as one of the people groups. I want to go into God's word this morning, though, so if you have your Bibles, please open them up to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, or you can also uh, look up on the screen as we, we see this passage this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it says this to us from God's word. It says, but thanks be to God, who always leads us captives in Christ's triumphant procession. Speaking to us as the body of Christ. And uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. Let's pray as we go into God's word. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the salvation that you give us as believers in Jesus Christ. Your word talks about how we are to rejoice in our salvation. And so as a body of uh, believers in obedience to your word, we, we celebrate, we rejoice in the salvation that you've given us by your grace through faith in Christ. We also thank you today, Heavenly Father, that, that you've given us other gifts. You've given us the Holy Spirit. You've given us your word. And so, Lord, we pray that your spirit would just be at work in hearts and lives here today speaking through us. Your spirit would help me to deliver this word as it is shared this morning for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name, I pray. And everyone said, Amen. 
It was the night of uh, December 31st, 2002. It was the night that I got engaged. And I can remember that night, we started out the night, Chris and I, we started out the night by going to her friend's house from church. And after that night, or after that time at her friend's house, we went back to Kristen's house, and it was about 5 before 12, and we were sitting on the living room couch talking. When Kristen said to me, I, she said, I'm going to get up and I'm going to turn on KTS and, and find out what KTS is doing to ring in the new year. And so she got up off the couch, she went over, she turned on the radio, and she came back and she sat down next to me again, and we could kind of make out what was going on on the radio and that they were praying in the new year, but we couldn't hear exactly what they were praying because the volume wasn't loud enough. And so Kristen said, I'm going to get up and I'm going to turn up the volume. And so she stood up and she went over to turn on the volume, up, turn up the volume on the radio. And I, I, I was going to propose to her that night. I just didn't know how I was going to do that. And I thought to myself, she's going up to turn up the volume. I'm going to come up behind her. I'm going to get down on one knee, and I'm going to propose to her. And so I got up off the couch, pulled the ring out of my pocket, and I got down on one knee. The only problem was I was shaking. I was so nervous. For you guys that, are, that got married, how many of you were nervous when you proposed to your wife? Just a couple. I was, I was terrified. I probably had never been so nervous in my life. I was shaking. But I, tried, I got down on one knee, and I tried saying my proposal, but I only ended up stuttering and stammering because I was so nervous. And because Kristen had her back to me, and because she didn't know what I was saying, she turned, she turned like this, she got down like this, and she was trying to listen to the radio, and she goes, shh, 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 quiet, quiet. I'm trying to listen to the prayer. And I'm thinking to myself when she says, hey, this isn't going so well. And about five seconds later, she turned around and she, she realized what I was trying to do. I managed to get my proposal out, and she said yes. I share that opening story with you this morning just to highlight the power of a story. That, that a story can make us chuckle and laugh. And the book of Proverbs says that, that laughter is good medicine. That it's good to have some humor. Jesus himself told stories to illustrate and communicate his truth. An indigenous culture is an oral storytelling culture. And so because stories can be so powerful, I want to walk us through a story this morning of the gospel related to indigenous peoples in the Americas, which includes a focus on the Quechua people. And I want to start out this morning by sharing about the past story of indigenous peoples in the Americas and a misconstrued gospel. Much of what has happened to indigenous people has been traumatic. It hasn't been what 2 Corinthians chapter 2 refers to, which is a life of triumph through Jesus. Here's a little bit about my own indigenous background and some of the trauma that I have experienced as a, as a result of my cultural heritage. And so my grandma was full-blood Ojibwe, and my grandpa was part Irish and, and part Ojibwe. You guys already probably knew that I'm, uh, uh, by my distinct indigenous last name of O'Leary, that I am indigenous, Right? Such a distinct indigenous last name. But you have to be about a quarter blood to be a member of an Ojibwe tribe in Minnesota. And just because I'm under a half, so I'm a member of, of Boys Ford, as I shared earlier about. But I grew up in World Duluth. And I can remember my first experience with racism was when I was about in seventh grade. I was sitting in my history class, and there were two boys in dust around me, and they knew about my cultural heritage, and so they started making these Indian chants to me. Eh? Chants to me. And as I experienced that, I thought to myself, boy, that's hurtful. That's, that's not a very pleasant feeling to experience something like that. And then I can remember in, in ninth grade, football. 
We were playing one of our rival teams, and another team, a team member on this team, he knew about my cultural background and that my family's enrolled in an Ojibwe tribe. And so, so throughout the game, he kept on saying these racist comments to me about my American Indian cultural heritage. And then as I pursued my childhood dream of playing college hockey and, and professional hockey, I, I ended up at Denver, as I shared about earlier. And I can remember the first week in class, I'm, the first week of school in class, I'm sitting in the cafeteria with teammates and the captain, senior captain of the team, he gave me this nickname called Chief because of my cultural background. And I had other things that were said and done to me because of my cultural background and even those who I was close to or sometimes teased because of their connection with me. But indigenous people in the United States have experienced other forms of trauma as well. In fact, there's this phrase that we used to describe it all. It's this phrase called historical trauma. It's this trauma that indigenous people in the United States have experienced in the past with things like Indian boarding school and forced removal of land. And it's a, it's a term that's used to describe why there are so many social problems amongst indigenous people. Why are there things like so, much bro so many broken families and, and suicide? And I could go on and talk about different social problems. Unless these things are freed from people. I'll share about one example real briefly about boarding schools. So boarding schools was basically about when the federal government said, we want to take indigenous children away. You can see where my grandma attended boarding school in Hayward, Wisconsin, several hours away from the Boys Port Reservation. But basically, again, it was the federal government's attempt to try to uh, take indigenous children away from their parents. They ended up doing that. And so they came to the reservation. They would take these kids and they put them in these distant, boor distant boarding schools to basically try to assimilate them into the rest of the culture, into the dominant culture. And my grandma would tell stories about what it was like being in boarding school. I never knew my grandpa okay, because he died before I was born. But my grandma would share stories. And she would say, you know what, when I was a kid, I was what we call a first language speaker that I, that I grew up and I didn't speak any, Engl any English. I only spoke Ojibwe. And she said, when I went to boarding school, when I spoke any of my language and when I wouldn't speak English, when I wouldn't speak English, they'd make me put my hands out in front of me and they'd take a ruler and they'd beat my hands with that ruler until they bled. And she said, I had a nine-year-old brother once. And this nine-year-old brother, he was standing on the top of the school stairs one day and the school disciplinarian was upset about something. And he walked up behind this nine-year-old boy and he shoved this kid down the stairs. And he broke his neck, and he died several days later because of that. And she shares more stories about what it was like being in boarding school. But I want to move on in this message because Riverwood is focusing on the Quechua Initiative and Quechua people, and so I want to shift my focus to this people group. It's important to know that this is a people group that has about 8 million people in it, about 8.2 million people. And so it's a larger people group the tribal members in the U.S., which have about 5 million, just over 5 million people groups in it. And again, Converge has, has said this is a least reached people group. And then it has a less than 4% Christians in it. And so the result of that is we've developed this vision of, for the Quechua Nation. Here's the vision. It's to see a growing and sustainable gospel movement. More than anything else, that's what Quechua people need. They need to see a gospel movement where Jesus is brought to the people. And it goes on to say this, that this will take place among the major Quechua people groups in this generation, that there has to be a sense of urgency of bringing the gospel to all these people groups. And any gospel initiative takes building relationships takes reaching out to people. And it takes love. Pastor Paul, myself, my wife, 
We have been building relationships with Quechua leaders over Zoom meetings. We're learning the stories about how people have been marginalized and oppressed in different ways. Quechua people are often seen as lower class citizens. We're hearing stories about how Quechua people don't believe in sexual abuse. Because sexual abuse is so common, it's so prevalent in Quechua culture, it's just accepted as a regular practice in the culture. We're hearing stories about high rates of alcoholism. We're hearing stories about high rates of illiteracy because the people are not given a chance at a decent education. Also, there's a scholar by the name of Eliana Barrio Suarez. She studied resilience among Quechua women in Peru in response to the aftermath of conflict in this country. Listen to this. According to Suarez, from about 1980 to 2000, an internal war between the rebel group Shining Path, otherwise known as Sendero Luminoso, and Peruvian armed forces took place in Peru. There was an attack on cultural practices within the indigenous villages as the Shining Path sought to bring about a cultural revolution. Shining Path, according to Suarez, began to become dismantled in 1992, but the threat of violence continued up until about 2000. Almost 70,000 Quechua people were either killed or disappeared as a result of this conflict. And about 75% were young male Quechuas. About 600,000 Quechua people were affected by massive displacement from their home communities. In short, Quechua people have experienced their own trauma. But that's not the only problem. Because there's also the problem of sin. In sin separates us from a holy God. Sin separates us from one another. And so millions of Quechua people have not started a relationship with Jesus yet. They have yet to have their sin forgiven and to participate in what 2 Corinthians chapter 2 is talking about, and that's a life of triumph through Jesus. Thankfully to the Lord, that's not the end of the story. I want to go on in this message, move on to what I would call Act 2 of the story and the present story of indigenous peoples in the Americas, and the urgency, the urgency of bringing the gospel to these people groups. So when we think about what a true and authentic gospel is in relationship to indigenous people, I think it's important to know the following. First, it includes the use of indigenous languages. That's so important. Pastor Paul and my wife and I were hearing from different Quechua leaders how it's so important to use the language when it comes to sharing the gospel. We're getting to know a man named Freddy. Freddy oversees a ministry called Atec in Cusco, Peru, right by Machu Picchu, one of the great wonders of the world. And Freddy is saying, it seems like when people hear the gospel in Spanish, Quechua people, they have a hard time grasping a hold of it. They have a hard time understanding it. They don't receive it. But when the gospel is shared in the Quechua language, people are able to understand it, people are able to grasp it, and they ultimately they receive Jesus much more when that happens. So the language is very important. Also, Revelation 7, it portrays people from every, listen, it's every tongue, tribe, a nation before God's throne, worshiping him in heaven. So heaven is a multicultural place. There are tribal people in it. The gospel also tells us that Jesus came from a tribal people group and that he came from the tribe of Judah. And the ultimate answer for Quechua people and for all of us comes in comes in three ways. I call these things the three great essentials for all of humankind. The first is justification, or stated another way, being declared not guilty 
by Jesus. Sanctification number two. We're growing to be more like Jesus here in our earthly lives. And number three, glorification, or going home to be with Jesus forever and being transformed to be more fully like him as we as believers receive this resurrected spiritual body in heaven. And so the question is this. What should the church be giving its attention to right now? What should we be talking about? What should we be praying about? I think God gives us some guidance about that, and it's found in the book of Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. Here's what it says. What does the Lord require of us? So in other words, God isn't giving us a suggestion in this passage. This is something that he commands of us. And it goes on to say this, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. What's happened in the past indigenous peoples was extremely unjust. And I think it's now time for the church to say, let's work at practicing justice. Let's pray about, let's talk about what does it look like for the church to show justice to indigenous people who have experienced all these different forms of injustice. There are people in, in Quechua villages who have fought for justice for years. As a result of what's happened through the shining path Consider the story of a lady. We could get that picture on the screen there. Her name is Mama Angelica. And a little bit about her. She was this 50-year-old, 54-year-old Quechua mother of eight when in the pitch black night of July 3rd, 1983, the door of her tiny concrete block home in the city of Ayacucho, Peru, was kicked in by men pointing assault rifles at her and her family. There were militant soldiers from the Shining Path. She tried to fight them off with her bare hands as they grabbed her 19-year-old son named Arquimedes, and they dragged him from his bed to a waiting military armored vehicle. She said these words. She says, I clung to my son, but they dragged me with him onto the street, punching me and kicking me and twisting my arm until I let go. Archimedes shouted back to her mom. She said, Mama, don't cry. I'm a big man now. Don't worry. I have done nothing wrong. After her son was hauled away, Mama Angelica, she anxiously waited throughout the night until the dawn, until the curfew was over. And then she went to the military base right around her, and she asked if they knew anything about her son, and she was told these words, No sabemos nada, or we know nothing. She bumped into some, some other Quechua people who were looking for their sons. And they didn't know any information. And so they formed this group called the National Association of Families of the Kidnapped, Detained, and Disappeared of Peru. She was a leader and she was the most public face nationwide. And then in 1985, she organized this first march. Accompanied by Argentina's 1980 Nobel Peace Prize winner, Adolfo Perez Esquivel. But during this march, she and others, they carried crosses. They carried photos of missing loved ones and, and cards that said, no matar or do not kill. She eventually campaigned for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to investigate what happened. And they finally gave in to her demand back in 2001, and this commission issued this terrible report in 2003. It stated that the Marxist Shining Path was responsible for most of the deaths, massacring with machetes any Quechua people who were sympathizers of the government. The report also blamed the government for the rest of the killings and human rights abuses as 75% of the dead were innocent Quechua people caught in the conflict between the government 
and the shining path. She died several years ago when she was 88 years old of pneumonia. But she fought for injustice. She said, I'm going to keep up the fight. And I think that should be the church today as well. We should be saying, we want to fight for the, for the justice of other people around us because God commands us to do that. And I think it's more than just carrying physical crosses. Jesus talks about in his word of what's required of us, and that's to deny ourselves and to pick up our crosses and to follow Jesus. It's, it's being a disciple. It's following him. And as we're doing that, we will show his compassion to others who have been traumatized and wounded. Let's think for a moment a church that is mobilized. How you can make a difference. You go down and you show God's compassion. You share the gospel. And other churches become a part of this. Catch what people can begin to participate in what 2 Corinthians talks about, and that's a life of victory and triumph through Jesus. I want to wrap this message up and share Acts 2 with you this morning. And the future story of indigenous peoples in the Americas and the global spread of the gospel. This coming summer, we are having an indigenous Christian unity conference in Bemidji. The theme of this conference is changing Native America from just being seen as a missions field to being a global missions force. The focus is on raising up other Native people and other people to go out into the world and to share the gospel. And at this conference in Bemidji, July 13th to the 15th, there's a Quechua leader by the name of Pablo who's coming. He leads this missions organization out of Lima, Peru. It's, it's called Runi Simi. I met him. I talked with him over Zoom. I'm excited to get to work with him more. I'm excited about connecting Riverwood to this leader as we work with him and other Quechua leaders to advance the gospel among this people group. And you might be asking this morning, well, what part can I play individually in seeing the gospel go forward among the Quechua people? I want to share this real quickly with you. I want to share six, string, six things with you to be in prayer about. And the first is pray pray. I'm thankful for Riverwood that you've already said we want to play a significant part when it comes to prayer in this initiative. We're going to pray. Because I've said this in previous messages that I've spoken in different places. I've said indigenous people will not come to Jesus apart from a great move of God. So prayer will make a difference. I ask you to pray for me as I leave Riverwood today. I'm going to the Rosebud Reservation where I'll be teaching throughout the week on the book of Psalms. Please pray for me as I go out there. Second word is go. Go. We could be taking a short-term trip to indigenous people here in North America or being a part of one of our short-term trips to catch with people in South America. Maybe someone within Riverwood would want to serve full-time in missions. As God is leading you to do that. Third word, give. Consider financially contributing to seeing catch with people. Be reached. Fourth, contribute ideas. I don't have all the answers. Here's what I do believe. I believe that God's Spirit can give us wisdom in what it looks like for the church to show justice. So be in prayer about that. Ask God, what does it look like for us as a congregation and congregations to show justice now? Fifth, mobilize. As God is leading, talk to other churches and individuals who sense God leading them to partner an indigenous ministry, and catch a ministry so that people are reached for the Lord and maybe just be a combination of some of the action items I just mentioned. And remember as you leave church today, final closing words. Know who you are as a believer. Know who you are. That you are not defeated. 
Sometimes we feel that way based on the circumstances of life. But based on 2 Corinthians chapter 2, you are victorious through Jesus. And if you haven't started a relationship with Jesus yet and would like to do that, I encourage you to talk to Pastor Paul or one of the other leaders in the church and they'd be happy, I'm sure, to help you begin life's most important relationship. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me, please? Heavenly Father, you tell us through your word that your word will not return void. You're accomplishing great and mighty things through it. And so, Lord, I pray that this word will go down deep into our hearts. It's based on your truth. And that you would use it to produce a harvest and bear fruit. All for your glory and your name's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. You want to stand and uh, sing this last song with us? faith to believe you when I'm stuck here in my fear give me the strength to trust you when my vision's blurred by tears give me a hope for tomorrow cause today has gone so wrong I'm on my knees give me the faith to believe Even when I cannot see you, you're still shining, you're still shining. Even when I cannot hear you, you're still calling out my name. Even when I cannot feel you, your arms are open, always holding on to me. Give me the faith to believe. say you'll never leave me and your love will conquer fear you say your day is coming and you'll wipe away my tears give me a hope for tomorrow cause today has gone so wrong I'm on my knees give me the faith to believe even when I can't see you you're still shining you're still shining and even when i cannot hear you you're still calling out my name and even when i cannot feel you your arms are open always holding on to me give me the faith to believe Give me the faith to see the invisible. Give me the faith to believe the impossible. Oh, give me the faith to receive the incredible. Oh, give me the faith to believe it. Oh, give me the faith to believe it. And even when I cannot see you, you're still shining, you're still shining. And even when I cannot hear you, you're still calling out my name. Even when I cannot feel you, your arms are open, always holding on to me. Even when I cannot see you, you're still shining, you're still shining. And even when I cannot hear you, you're still calling out my name. 
And even when I cannot feel you, your arms are open, always holding on to me. Even when I cannot see you, you're still shining, you're still shining. Even when I cannot hear you, you're still calling out my name. And even when I cannot feel you, your arms are open, always holding on to me. Well, I'm uh, glad that when uh, Phil spoke, he mentioned the Great Commission. You know, I, I've read a Barna survey. That, you can sit down for a second. <laughs> I read a Barna survey that said 51% uh, of Evangelical Christians are not, familiar, are not familiar with the term the Great Commission. And uh, that can't be true about Riverwood Church. Um, and just to re reiterate that, it says, Go and make disciples in all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And, you know, we, we, uh, there's, th th it's a wide world. Um, and, uh, like, and you could throw a dart any place on the map. We can't do it all. That's what the 210... Is about is about focusing our efforts where we can, where, where it can be effective, and that's uh, where we felt led to the Quechua initiative. So um, uh, here's my benediction from Philippians one. What Paul said to them, he said, "Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you, that you stand firm in one spirit, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing frightened by your opponents." God help us to do that, and God bless you. Amen.